Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to our service this morning. As we go into our prayer time this morning, we have a, a number of people dealing with illness and things like that. Uh, one person uh, I would like to bring to your attention is uh, Eileen uh, Dumont. She's um, dealing with a cough on top of everything else that she's got going on to the point that um, there's some concern about her eardrums and uh, bleeding and all this kind of stuff. So just not good. Uh, also, uh, Anna Giesbrick is home from the hospital. Uh, she was dealing with COVID. Um, so there's just a variety of people that have illnesses uh, going on. Um, Marnie's been out with COVID. Uh, I'm a bit nasally, took a test this morning, negative, all this kind of stuff. So it's just that time of year uh, where we start dealing with uh, what is it I'm sick with? Uh, and so be aware of that. Uh, and we appreciate all your consideration uh, when you are not feeling well uh, that you'll join us online. Uh, but just remember them in prayer. I know in your bulletin it also said pray for Ukraine. Uh, still just a dire situation um, whenever people start using and talking about weapons uh, that uh, can cause serious damage. Uh, it's always a concern and frightening. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. As always, our altars are always open. Uh, if you feel led to come, I encourage you to do so. Uh, be obedient in that uh, moving of the Spirit. Well, let's encounter the Lord's throne room this morning. Lord, as we take a moment to pause and rest, may we find a moment of Sabbath in this quiet moment as we approach you with our minds and our hearts and all the concerns, the things that are weighing us down. Lord, there's a number that need a physical healing touch in our community. Lord, I pray that you are with them. Touch their body. Make them whole. Remove the sickness. Lord, we pray for those who are recovering from surgeries and uh, I think of Gail Thorpe this morning as she recovers from knee surgery. Lord, draw near to her. May the therapy uh, go smoothly. And Lord, I pray for our world. Uh, there's a number of battles and wars waging on around the world. Lord, I pray that your spirit will continually intercede on our behalf, on our brothers and sisters around the world's behalf. Lord, and I pray for peace. Lord, I also pray for uh, finances. Lord, sometimes those can be overwhelming. They, um, it's a constant stress. And so, Lord, I just give you glory that you are a faithful provider. And, Lord, I pray for the number of outreach activities that we as a church participate in. I think of Mama's Meetup, our Pro D-Day coming up, Trunk or Treat, all these different things where we as a church, as, as a body of believers, have the opportunity to encounter our community. Lord, may we shine bright. May people experience our love. The love that you have for us, may it overflow and radiate to our community. And Lord, I pray for those who are not able to gather with us this morning, that if they're homebound, if they're joining us online, wherever it may be, that they will know and experience your spirit this morning. That they will know they are thought of and loved and cared for. And Lord, be with us in our time this morning as we open your word. Speak to us. Reveal your truth to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I can stand right here this week. 
The last few weeks, we've had a, a table setting of, of different uh, examples of what we could have as far as dinner parties and things like that. And, and since I don't have uh, any visual representation up here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring show and tell. My kids had VIP this week, a very important person day at school, and they were so excited to take their rock collection. Uh, Tucker took an entire box that was way too heavy for him, but he said, oh, Dad, I can bring the whole thing. I said, pick two or three. Nope. So I was excited. I'm going to do show and tell over the next few weeks uh, and show you some things. This is a trophy. This is a trophy uh, that brought me joy when I won it. Anybody know what this is? A racing helmet. Now, it is a first place trophy. Now, you might be thinking, oh, what'd you race? Well, it was, it was a go-kart. It wasn't anything crazy, but they, the go-karts did anywhere from, you know, about 35 to 40 miles an hour. They would move a uh, mile-long indoor track. And what it was, the reason this brought me so much joy, is on the SNU region, which is our Southern Nazarene University, on that area, uh, the youth pastors from four different states would always come to SNU every fall, and they would do some training. But when you get a bunch of youth pastors together, some of that training is fun. And so after the training, we would go out and do different activities, bowling or maybe miniature golf. But one year, the guy who led it all, he splurged, and he got us into an indoor racing track. And we go, and there's about 45 of us. We all sign up our names, and the way it's going to work is we would race 12 at a time, and we would get 10 laps. And what we would do is we would take... Uh, the top 20 times, so you're just trying to get a time, and then we would do two semifinal races. And then from there, we would take the top 10 times, and we would race one final race for placement. Not time anymore, that last one was all about placement. And so when it all came down to it, I raced my little heart out, and I'm driving that go-kart as fast as I could. I was number two. I didn't quite get the pole position, but I was number two in that final race. And the guy in front of me, man, he had put up a really good time. What it was, don't remember, don't even know mine. But now I'm in second place, so I'm thinking, oh, if I just hold everybody off, I got the podium. Maybe second, may not be first, but I can do it. So here we go. He's right in front of me. I'm off to his side, and we start. Well, I don't know if you've ever gone to, like, random go-kart places, but so much of your victory is dependent on the cart you get. And I happened to get a really good cart. And the guy in front of me got by far the worst cart on the track. Because within the first couple curves, I was able to pass him. And from there on, all I did was block everybody and everybody that tried to come and get me. And you know what? At the end of the four or five laps or whatever it was, I was in first place. And so I stood up on a podium and I, I received my little helmet trophy. I was so excited. I was ecstatic. I was happy. The next year we went back. We didn't go to go-karts, though. I think we moved back to miniature golf. You know who remembered who won? Me. <laughs> Nobody else. No one else remembered who won last year. It was just me. My joy was overflowing for myself. No one else could care. And so that made me a little sad. And so I want to tell you another story about joy, despite circumstances. That one's silly, because that one was all about me. But uh, right before the pandemic began, in February of 2020, we loaded up our kids, uh, and drove to an airport, and we flew down to San Jose, Costa Rica. We were going to go spend a week on the beach, in the mountains, in the jungles, wherever. So we get to San Jose, spend the night, the next morning... We get in a car and we're driving three hours to our Airbnb down the coast. Well, we come over this mountain, and as we go down the hill, you start to see it. There is the Pacific Ocean. Our kids had never seen a big ocean. They'd seen the Gulf of Mexico, not nearly as exciting as seeing the Pacific. And so we see this hill, and we, we're like, oh, man, we got to stop. And there's this little alcove, and so we pull over, and we park, and we're unloading everybody. Oh, man, this is so exciting. 
We take them out on the beach, and there's this little river that runs into it, and it's outlet, and kids are getting their feet wet and splashing around. And we were only there about 15 minutes because we still had another hour and a half to drive. Oh, it was fantastic. Walk back to the car, and we get in, and we sit down, and I go to back out, and Alicia goes, where's my backpack? Uh, I don't know, did you put it in the back? And so we slam the car into park, and we get out, and we look, and she's like, no, it was right here. I know it was. Well, come to find out the car wasn't locked for the 15 minutes, and we were no more than 100 yards from the car at any given point. But in that time, someone had opened up the door and made off with Alicia's purse and backpack, which coincidentally had four of the five passports, plus driver's license, car. It was, it was an awful sinking feeling. We're literally 12 hours into our trip. And so we sat there not knowing what to do. We look up on my passport, a number to call, and they'll connect you with the U.S. Embassy, and we finally made it through. And they said, well, you'll have to come on Friday. This is a Monday. Come to us, and we'll see what we can do. Well, now we've got this thing hanging over us. We went from our kids' faces, this joy. We've got pictures of it, of this joy that they're experiencing. Seeing the ocean for the first time, and then this letdown. They were dead silent in the back of the car. And if you know kids, that's unusual. And so it was really hard. We, we didn't know what to do. We've never been in this situation. Alicia's traveled to Africa some seven, eight different times. You know, we've both traveled extensively. This has not happened before. And, and what ended up happening was, come to find out, this car, if any door was partially open, would not lock. And so probably one of the kids was still getting out on the other side when I was locking it. And all the late model cars in Costa Rica, when they're locked, their side mirrors do this. So when someone looks at it and they see mirrors sticking out, they instantly know that car is unlocked. And so when we went to the embassy, the, we, were, we were at this little restaurant waiting on Alicia, and this guy goes, where'd you get your stuff stolen? And we told him exactly where it was. He's like, yep, it's probably somebody's cousin at the rental car. And he meant it. Like, he wasn't joking. He said, it's, that is the highest crime portion because those passports were worth about four to $5,000 a piece because they, could, they have all the accoutrements and they can change a picture and commit fraud and all those things. So it was an overwhelming time, but we finally made it to our Airbnb and Alicia, she's devastated because she's taken all the brunt. She says, it's my fault. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's not, it's not your fault. It's no one's fault. But we're truly going, how are we going to get over this? How are we going to enjoy a trip with our kids when this has happened? And, and this looming thing of we need passports to even get home. Um, but we prayed about it. And we sat there and we said, all right, we're going to wake up tomorrow. And we're going to do what we were going to do. And we're going to enjoy this trip. And, and you know what? It took a lot. It took a lot to find joy in some of those moments. But it was amazing to see God's hand in those moments, even when it seemed dire. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to look at joy and see what uh, the book of Philippians has to say about it, what, what Paul in his letter to the Philippians says about joy. So this morning we're going to be in chapter 1, we'll probably work around to verse 18, starting with verse 1. It says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you, because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because you hold me in your heart, for all of you share in God's grace with me, 
both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight, to help you to determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. So let's spend a couple moments looking at some of these words that Paul has written. First off, his interaction, he's writing to a church of believers. And so over the last uh, little bit, we've talked about radical hospitality, and a lot of that was this outward-facing evangelism and some of that kind of mentality. But uh, this, what Paul is writing, is to a group of believers. He's writing to people that he has been in relationship with, the people that know God as he knows God. And when he thinks about those people, he experiences joy. Now, if I were to ask you, when you think about the people in your body of believers, in your family as a church, do you experience joy? Good. Or do you find yourself a little bit curmudgeon Eric does. No, Paul's writing to these people and he says, hey, we've gone on a journey together. Because of who God is, because of His saving grace, because of who God is, I experience joy. Not just joy for myself, but joy for each and every one of you. And I love what Paul says. He says, I am confident of this. Confident of this. That the one who began a good work will stop and not really do it all. Did I read that right? No, he's confident that what? God is going to do what? Be faithful and see it through to the end. He's telling this church in Philippi and saying, hey, I know the Lord and I've experienced it. You will see him through all things and you will experience his goodness all the way to completion of the good work that he's doing in your life. But what is that good work? Did you guys pick it up? We have to go down a couple verses before we really see what that good work is. And it's that your love may overflow. So this morning, the example that Sherry did with Bailey and uh, seeing that overflow, we're talking about joy overflowing, and we'll get there in just a minute. But what about the love of God overflowing in us? And we talk about loving uh, all those people out in the world and things like that, but we've got to really start thinking about what does it mean to love one another here in this community? Because remember, if, if you start thinking about the people you're in relationship with here and you don't feel joy welling up in you, then we've got to have a conversation. What's going on? How, how can we love you? How can we elicit that joy? Uh, well, what work can the Lord do in your life to help you experience His joy? Because Paul tells him, I am praying that the love of the Lord will overflow in your life, not just emotionally. Paul's writing in a way that, and coming from a culture that there's kind of two separate things. The head and the heart are very distinct. Um, And he's asking that not just emotionally will you love one another, but that you'll come to know what it means to love one another. That full of insight, so all the knowledge, your brain will work, and you will know, not just feel like you love one another, but you will know what it means to love one another. And then Paul continues on. He says, I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me He's talking about being imprisoned, has actually helped to spread the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, 
dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. And the others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering and end my imprisonment. What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true. And in that, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. So Paul's in prison. I almost asked, has anyone ever been to prison? I'm not going to ask that. But there's times where we feel like we're in bondage. We find ourselves in circumstances uh, that are dire and overwhelming. When we were in Costa Rica and we all of a sudden find ourselves uh, violated with the theft of things that belong to us, with the, the potential to cost us significant amounts of money, we did not know what to do. And there was part of me that wanted to throw the biggest tantrum <laughs> and say, this is not fair. We went to the, the local police station about 15 minutes from where the things were stolen. And they were courteous. They were nice enough. They took some information. But it was just a formality to make me feel a little better. Um, but what we truly did is we rested in the knowledge that God was going to be there. And I look at that situation and I think now uh, about some of the circumstances and how I can use it as a testimony that God provides. There's more to the story when we went on Friday to the embassy and things like that. But through that situation, God has been glorified. God has been glorified, and Paul is saying that. He's like, look, I'm in prison. It's not great. But because I am, guess what? The gospel is spreading. People know about who Jesus is because of my circumstances. You know, and there's people out there that are talking about Jesus uh, just out of spite or, or out of rivalry. You know what he says? Good. You know why? Because Jesus' name is being glorified. It's being lifted up, and it is spreading the gospel. And so we talk about what Paul is writing to the Philippians. He's like, hey, you guys, you got to find joy in one another. you got to have your, the love for one another welling up in you. And when it does, no matter what circumstances you guys face, the gospel of Jesus will be told, will be spread. So what does that look like for us? How do we handle this? What does this look like for us in a practical aspect of what does it mean to do this? Well, I had a situation this week uh, that was kind of cool. So has anyone, there's a few of us, how many of you ever participated in Mama's Meetup in some fashion, whether as a participant or a volunteer? Uh, so there's a few of us. So Mama's Meetup's been going on for, I don't know, four years or so? Oh, baby, so five years, somewhere in there. Well, we had a couple walk in our doors Thursday morning, and I, they were coming in, and as I opened the door, uh, they were speaking a language I was not familiar with, and they said, hey, uh, we're looking about getting schooling for our son, and they had a little man, and they said he's four and a half, and I was like, well, so we don't have a school, we don't have a daycare. And I was like, but the administration building is a couple doors down. I can walk you down there and, you know, we can see. I, I think they have a strong start program and they have a couple other things that he might be eligible for. And so we walked down there. And as we're walking, I, I asked him his name and uh, he told me his name. And he said, you know, sorry, we, our English isn't very good. We, we speak Punjabi at home, which that means they're either from northern India or Pakistan. And so I, I never asked. I don't know what the, the details are. But we went into the administration building, and we were there for about 30 minutes, and we had a conversation with the administrators. And uh, I just I had the opportunity to be an advocate for them. And when it all was all said and done, we, they felt pretty good about it. But as we're walking, I didn't understand why they had darkened our doors. It didn't make sense. And they were like, but about your school. And I was like, but we don't have a school. 
I said, we do a mama's meetup on Wednesdays. And when I said mama's meetup, they went, that. They had heard that term somewhere. And I was like, but it's, it's not really a school. I said, it's more of a social group. And, and they said, well, what we want is for him to be around kids. And we want him to speak or hear English. Because at home, we just speak Punjabi. And we want him to be around that. And I said, well, it's there. It's open. It's available. And so they're still looking at that. But uh, he, we exchanged numbers. And, and he said, well, we'll be there next Wednesday. And so in two days' time, we may see uh, if somebody shows up because they darkened our doors And Sherry had it on her heart a few years ago to love her community because the love was overwhelming and overflowing through her. And one of the things that I think we often struggle with is we expect all of our outreach to put butts in seats. How many of you guys would love this place to be packed on Sunday mornings? I'm with you. Amen. Amen. But you know what? Sometimes the church takes place in places that we least expect it. And if you've never been a part of Mama's Meetup, reach out to Sherry. You know, you don't have to week in and week out, but come and see the church in action. Because we love each other well, because we want to support Sherry, we want to support the moms that are in our congregation, guess what? The gospel of Jesus is being put before people. And so we have these things in our church, these practical things that are taking place where our love is overflowing because of the love of Jesus in our lives, and then we get to see his message proclaimed. It may not look like what we think, and hopefully someday some of those translate to butts and seats. Maybe two times the girls there. Yeah, I do lead uh, the songs at Mama's Meetup. It's kind of embarrassing. Barb dances really well, too, though. I mean, Barb doesn't dance. She's an old school Nazarene. But what does it look like practically for you? So I ask you this. When you think of the people in your midst, in your family, as you think of them and they come to mind, when you experience that joy or the concern about them, let them know. You know, I've had to work on this with my kids. I'm really good at telling them what they've done wrong. You know what I'm not very good at? Telling them the positive things. And I think we do that as a church family, too. Sometimes we we don't talk to each other until there's a crisis. Instead of saying, hey, I was thinking about you. Man, I really appreciate A, B, and C that you do. So when people come to your mind, as you pray for them, let them know. That's a practical thing to do. And then the outreach side of it, no matter our circumstances, always give glory to God. No matter our circumstances, because in those moments, that's when the gospel will be furthered. That's when the gospel will be furthered. We can tell people all day long until we're blue in the face. But until they see us in a moment of crisis, until they see us in a moment of heartache, Continuing to give God glory, a lot of times they don't think it's genuine. They've got to see, what's, will we pass the muster when it comes to that point? Whenever crisis is here, will we give God glory? And I say we will, but it comes from letting God overwhelm us with joy and love and being steadfast in Him. Can we do that, church? So there are a few things outreach-wise that we're doing. I encourage you to get connected with those. Over the next few weeks, we'll continue to look at these circumstances of what does it mean to have joy? Because joy is not just that simple thing of, oh, I'm happy. It's something that's far deeper, that takes root in us. Because, man, a Mountain Dew and a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup will make me real happy. Until I put my pants on later. But joy is something that finds itself far deeper and rooted in us. So as we go through the next few weeks, we're coming into a season where it's pretty easy to have joy. Although until it's not. Because a lot of times, uh, depression spikes around the holidays. And we don't think about that because, well, it's a happy occasion for us. So let us go into this season 
with hope and joy, but also an awareness that no matter our circumstances, God is good and God's message will be told. Let us pray this morning, and as I do, if our praise team will come, we'll close in a song. And then I'm going to go ahead and pray for the meal, because I don't always make it down there, and then I get in trouble. Lord, thank you for these words uh, that Paul wrote to the Philippians. That as we think of one another, that will be filled with joy and concern. And Lord, I pray that we will express that. That we will be people that see God work in our lives and we will express it to one another. And Lord, as we lift each other up, that uh, your love will be so overwhelming, so overflowing in our lives, that no matter the circumstances, you will be glorified. Your message will be proclaimed. So, Lord, I pray for our ministries, those things that uh, are our church, that we don't always see uh, the effects of it on Sunday morning, our gathering time. But, Lord, where we see your message proclaimed, where we see you do work, in the midst of people who have not encountered you yet. So Lord, I pray that as we go through the rest of the month, as we come up on uh, Trunk or Treat and Pro D Days and uh, Mama's Meetup continuing, Lord, may we see good work done in those moments. May we see you glorified in the midst of chaos, of frustrations, of heartache, And Lord, may we stand fast. And as uh, Philippians said, may we proclaim your good news with boldness to let people know that our joy comes from the Lord and no other place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.